I know that we still have some people joining us and that is totally fine, but let's go ahead and get started. Um, so first, I just wanted to let you know that we are recording this event so that we can send it to you all and those who are unable to join us today um, after the event and also post it on our website. So with that, let's get started. So welcome everyone. I'm so excited to see so many people here with us for this Lunch and Learn. So my name is Megan Orman. I am a PhD student at the University of Pittsburgh where I study children's connection to nature. Um, I'm currently on a Fulbright fellowship though. So I'm doing research in Iceland for nine months. And so I'm very excited to be hosting this Lunch and Learn, or for us, it's a Dinner and Learn uh, from Reykjavik. And part of the Fulbright mission is to build cross-cultural connections, um, not just in our area of research, but also broadly. So I invited folks from the Icelandic gardening groups that I'm in to join this meeting as well. So if you are joining from Iceland, I just wanna say golden dying. Um, so in addition to being a PhD student, I'm also co-chair of Pitt's Pollinator Habitat Advisory Committee, uh, which is part of Pitt's Chancellor's Advisory Committee on Sustainability. So if you're not familiar with Pitt's Sustainability Council, we are doing amazing work here at Pitt. The University of Pittsburgh is proud to rank number 34 of US institutions in social and environmental sustainability in higher education, and we seem to be climbing. Um, so I will put in the chat here um, a couple links if you want to learn more about the Sustainability Council. And then also we have this pretty cool map. Um, it's an interactive map of all the projects that um, and efforts that Pitt Sustainability is doing on the University of Pittsburgh's campus. So here on the Pollinator Advisory Committee, our goal is to help make our campus environment more supportive of healthy native pollinator populations. So we do this through outreach, educational workshops like this one, and maintaining our status as a B campus through the Xerce Society. So you can also read more about us at this link. And so with that, we are excited to host this Lunch and Learn with Greg Null. So Greg is the Assistant Director for Assessment and Accreditation at the School of Medicine and also a member of our Pollinator Habitat Committee. An avid gardener, Greg has taught workshops on native rain garden design, construction and maintenance. And today he's going to talk with you all about starting native plant seeds now. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Greg. And although I am super excited for this, this workshop, I'm also going to try and monitor um, the chat and the audience throughout. So if I, you can put them in the chat and we'll try and cover those as we go. And then there'll also be some time for Q&A at the end. So, all right, Greg, it's all you. Thank you very much. Hi, and uh, <clears throat> thanks for joining us today and spending you know your meal time with us to talk about native plants and storing seeds. Can you see my slides? Yep. All right. Okay, a couple objectives. So the plan today is to go over a few different things. Let me move this around. Give me one second here. Okay. Um, you know, the objectives today are to go over, you know, and hopefully when you leave here, you'll be able to understand methods of native seed germination. We're going to talk about building a seed starter from some stuff you might already have around the house. Um, and also go over some expectations. What should you expect? you know, if you decide to start planting some seeds this winter. This is normally a place where we give disclosures. So I'll give you the disclosure that, you know, I am not a botanist. I am not a, a plant scientist, you know, or anything along those lines. You know, I, I come to you with experience in this area. I've done my homework, um, you know, and I'll try to answer any questions that you have. Um, another disclosure, just to say that, you know, this is going to be kind of high level. Every plant, every plant community, every seed, you know, has different needs. Um, so we may not get to your favorite plant, you know, and uh, but we'll try to do the best we can. Okay, so why native plants? You know, when we talk about native plants, we're talking about plants that grew up um, in this area and have been in this area for, you know, what, thousands of years, maybe more. Um, and in doing so, you know, they've adapted to this area. They've adapted to our weather. 
you know, they love the cold, wet winters. They love the hot, humid summers. They don't care about that, you know, like two days of February when it's 70 degrees and then it drops to 10 degrees the next week. You know, they uh, like our clay soil and things along those lines. So they're generally not fussy. When you're listening to the weather reports and they go and say like, hey, you got to go out and cover your plants because of frost. You don't need to cover these. You know, they're very adaptable um, and they work in this area already. Another good thing about native plants is that they're magnets for native bees and butterflies. So, you know, in addition <clears throat> to having, you know, these gorgeous flowers, which we all love about them, you know, the whole reason that plants are alive is to reproduce, right? So they put out these flowers so the pollinators will come so we can have seeds, get the next generation of plants. Um, but in doing so, you know, you pull out not just honeybees, but bumblebees and butterflies and beetles and, and you know, all these different types of insects um, that come and pollinate. And then there's this additional uh, benefit that some of these plants are host plants, which means that, so for instance, in like caterpillar or, or in, in butterflies and moths, they'll come lay their eggs on very, very specific plants. Um, and then once those eggs hatch, the pupae, the caterpillars or whatever it is, they can only eat certain types of leaves, okay? So if you're a monarch butterfly, you lay your eggs on milkweed, that's all they can eat. If they lay eggs on an apple tree, um, you know, those caterpillars will starve. So it's an interesting system, you know, that is at work here when you start to plant native plants. That's another part of this that is bird food. I love birds. I want lots of birds to come to my yard. Um, you know, every spring, if you think about you know, the baby birds and the mommy birds and everything else like that, what are they feeding them? They're feeding them these fleshy, gross worms, grubs, caterpillars, stuff like that. Even those birds that have been at your bird feeders all winter, you know, when it comes to feeding their young and preparing to have young, they switch over to this. So having these types of plants also feeds them. Um, and then in addition, in the winter time, once the plants go to seed, you know, the birds eat the seeds. And while they're eating the seeds, they make a big mess. They throw seeds everywhere. Those become new plants. Um, and then they also eat the seeds. They poop out the seeds. Oftentimes those seeds are also, you know, will plant in your neighbor's yard. So it's a, an interesting system there too. And the other thing is just about the roots. Um, if you look to the right here, you'll notice in the middle is Kentucky uh, bluegrass which most of us, if you have a lawn, this is what, you know, your lawn is made of. You know, if you're talking about that grass, you know, the, the roots are about one, two inches long, maybe. Um, but then look at the plants that are around it. These could go down, you know, the, the one on the right there, Ontario Blazing Star, it's like 15 feet. It's incredible. This is what allows these plants to survive the winter. This is what allows these plants to survive drought. When we think back to June, we were very hot last year. We had very little rain and my lawn was crispy, brown, pretty much dead. And all of my native plants were all thriving. It was a wonderful thing. So that's some of the reasons why native plants are important. We're gonna talk about growing your own plants from seed. Why don't you just go to the store and get it? Well, for one thing, it's a better variety, all right? If you walk into a big box nursery, number one, it's hard to tell. Um, what plants are native, what plants are non-natives, you know, and the native varieties that they do have are very limited. So, you know, right off the bat, if you decide to plant certain plants, you know, you can, you can have a better variety, um, you know, for your yard. It's also more economical. I'm assuming if you're on this call, you work for Pitt or you go to Pitt, no one here is getting rich. So this is a good way to, you know, to save money because if you buy a packet of seeds and there's a hundred seeds in there, even if only 10 of them survive, which is a, you know, a really low number, they'll probably have more that survive. You know, if you went to Lowe's, that would cost you 80 bucks. If you went to some other, you know, local nursery, that could be 120 bucks to get those 10 plants. Um, so it's an economical way to do it. I am always, you know, shocked and in awe of how this whole process works. So that's, this picture is Joe Pieweed. It's got these gorgeous magenta flowers. 
This thing is 15 feet tall. It's ridiculous. It swings around and I love it. And, you know, it all comes from a seed that's, you know, a little bit smaller than a sesame seed. And you get all this, you know, it's covered with pollinators when it's in bloom. Um, bugs and beneficial insects, you know, hibernate inside the stems. Um, and it's, you know, ridiculous when the wind blows because it's like literally all over the place. So, you know, it's, I, I always appreciate it just because, you know, it's amazing. You have this little seed and then you get this. Um, you know, for me, this is also a time to think of spring. If you start planning now, it makes me think of spring. I mean, let's face it, our winters suck. And this is one way to kind of move beyond that. And then if you've ever tried um, starting seeds for vegetables or anything else like that, it always, to me at least, always seems easy until it's like, oh, now I need grow lights. Oh, now I need heating pads. Oh, I, you know, I need a, a partner that will, is okay with all these like pots and, you know, all over the kitchen and stuff like that. This, in this method, we're going to talk about today. It's all outside. So it'll hopefully, you know, be a lot cheaper for you and you'll need less equipment. You do need to learn quite a bit when you're going down this journey. So here's just a couple resources, particularly for native plants. You know, the number one resource, as far as I'm concerned, is the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. That's wildflower.org. And they have a database of native plants from all over the country. You know, there's a lot of great information. Everything that you would want to know about a native plant is in there. You know, pictures of what it looks like when it's young, pictures what it looks like when it's mature. How much room does it need? What kind of soil requirements? You know, how do you stratify seeds? Stuff like that. You can literally go in there in an advanced search and set the parameters to ask, you know, I live in Pennsylvania. I want a plant that's three feet tall. I want it to bloom in May. And I want those blooms to be blue. And you can put that in and search and they'll give you a list of all the plants that will do that for you. The Audubon Society also has a lot of good resources about native plants. If you're interested in like bug forward landscaping, Xerxes Society is a place that will really say if you're interested in getting certain butterflies or bees or whatever the case like that, you know, they have a lot of resources for that. Penn State Extension as our land grant institution for the Commonwealth, you know, also holds lots and lots of resources concerning starting seeds and native plants. And that's also where, you know, this, you know, how I'm going to tell you about using milk jugs to get to this way it's from them. And then FIPS down the street, lots of good stuff there. Let's talk a little bit about seeds. So here, let's see so I can see you better. Um, to the left, wild senna is a, is a native seed variety. It's a legume. As you can see, they kind of look like, and they're about the size of, of, um, of lentils. You know, there's a couple things going on with this seed that you need to know. So again, we've talked about the whole reason for a plant's existence is to reproduce and is to get to this stage, to get the seeds that kind of continue, you know, the generations, you know, moving forward. These seeds require and have certain um, traits that allow it to survive our winters. So for wild senna, this is what happens. This thing blooms all summer. It's done blooming probably about September. And at that point, it sets its seeds in little pods. If those seeds were to break open and fall to the ground and then start germinating at that point, what would happen is that by the time we get the frost, it would kill all the baby seedlings, right? Because it needs the warmth, it can't do these things. So this, these traits that have adapted over time allow these seeds that they will not germinate until they go through this cold stratification. And through the cold stratification, what that means is that in essence, they have to hang out all winter. And inside each seed is a little bit of moisture and all of the um, you know, energy it needs to put up that first set of leaves. And as we go through the freeze cycle, the thaw cycle, you know, it breaks down the covering of these um, of these seeds that come April, come May, it'll be broken down enough to then germinate. So if it didn't do that, you know, all the seeds would probably die because there's not enough time. You know, this wild senna as a legume also requires some sort of scarification. 
you know, naturally how that happens is a burby eats it and poops it out, you know, but it will also work that if you get these plants outside in the winter time, the freeze thaw cycle will also, you know, break down the enzymes that will allow this to then grow. In the middle, we have early sunflower. This also needs the moist stratification as well for all the same reasons. It's a different type of plant. It's a different type of seed, but it needs that freeze thaw in order to start germinating next spring. Now, New England aster, a great plant, purple, you know, you know, a purple flower with a little yellow center. This requires no stratification. And it's interesting, um, why not? Because, you know, this grows and blooms September and October. And by the time the seeds form, we've already hit the frost date. So even if they fall to the ground, the plant, you know, not that it's thought about this, but it didn't need the adaptation to say, oh, we don't want this starting to grow early. So it doesn't have that type of adaptation to say, oh, I can just, you know, I could fly all over the place and then they're not going to bloom until it warms up in, in April. Here's a few types of, um, You know, we're going to talk a lot, but we're not talking about trees today. We're not talking about shrubs or anything else like that. You know, we're talking about these kind of ornamental plants um, from here. And there's really three varieties we'll go through today. Annuals. Oh, this is all messed up. Um, annuals on the left in the middle, or biennials and then perennials. I'm sorry. It seems like something's stopped. It's kind of muffled um, up the deal here. So for the annuals, this one on the left, this is a partridge pea. It's a native annual. You know, in one year, it has, you know, everything happens in one year. The seed is planted. It gets roots. It gets foliage. It gets flowers. It gets seeds all in one year. At the end of that, it dies. It moves forward to the next generation through those seeds, you know, and then that's it. In the middle category here, we have biennials and biennials have a two year life cycle. One you know, popular biennial is the black eyed Susan. And what happens with these is that the year that the, the seed is planted, it gets nothing but foliage. So it gets nothing but leaves. You know, it starts growing you know, extensive roots in preparation for the second year where it'll have lots of blooms. And then the seeds from those blooms are what's gonna continue the next generation because this individual plant will survive for two years and then that's it. And then on the right side, this is called a, incredibly, a sneeze weed. It's like who named that? You know, certainly no one from marketing, but I love it. Cause look at it, look at that big bulbous nose on it. Anyway, so it's a perennial. So it's a multi-year um, life cycle. So what that means is that it's kind of slow growing the first one or two years, and in the third year, it blooms. But the reason it takes so long is that the annual, you get one good year out of it. The biennial, you get two good years. But a perennial can last, I mean, if it's sited well, if it gets everything that it needs, you know, it will last for, for decades, potentially. So more about the process. Generally, and we're going to speak mostly about perennials. Now, I will say, you may say, like, why would I want annuals? Why would I even plant biennials when I could get perennials? If you were thinking about planting a garden from scratch, it might be good to have all three of these, because if you plant the first year annuals, you have instant color, you know, while the perennial is still growing, you know. So if you plant some annuals and some biennials, That'll help kind of work you through the three-year process until you know you get your blooms in the in the third year. The three-year process for perennials is sometimes known as sleep, you know, creep and leap. Um, I can't believe this is all mixed up, but you could follow around. We're all intelligent people, you know. We could we could get through this. The first year, okay, this is what you can expect. Now, again, this is the year where the 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 seeds were. Um, the seeds were planted. What we're showing here is purple cone flower. Purple cone flower generally gets about four feet tall. In the first year, really on the left is all you're getting. You're probably getting about a foot in height 
and about a quarter of the size, no flowers. The first year, probably no flowers. The perennial, particularly in its first year, is going to put all most of its energy in the roots, okay? Getting those long, huge roots that are going to be able to, you know, allow it to exist for years to come. So that's your first year. The second year, it's called creep. And it's slower growth. Maybe now we're up to about two feet. Maybe there's just a few um, blooms, you know, but that's really about it. You know, it's still alive. Things are happening, but it's not the full size deal. And then the third year, you should be about full size. Four feet, you know, this picture looks like there's about three plants there, you know, four feet, lots of blooms, and then you're good from then on. Really, after this point, it needs very little care. You know, at that point, it's got an extensive root system. You know, it's got lots of flowers coming up, making lots of seeds. So you should be all good. So if you're still with me, you want to think about, you know, what kind of plants, if you want to go through this whole process, what kind of plants might you be interested in planting? You know, so the first question I always ask people are like, oh, I'd like to do that. It's like, well, what do you want to do with your plants? You know, do you have a home with a garden so you have a place to plant these because like no one wants to plant them and just throw them away when they're done right so do you have a place where you'd like to plant them um you know do you want to donate them to a community garden or some place where they can you know you, they can take them and use them and, and be grateful for them you could certainly just give these things away or you could sell them as well um you know just a disclaimer at pit you know if you do grow these please do not plant them into pits beds, you know, there's a whole stable of groundskeepers and planters and things like that. Um, you know, they have plans for those. So please just don't say, oh, you know what, I'm just going to go plant them over there. No one will notice. Someone will notice and they're probably coming out. Um, and that, you know, is a lot of work for nothing. The next thing you want to think about is where will these plants thrive? The USDA sets out a map, which is on the right, that kind of separates the country into different zones. In the Pittsburgh area, we're known to be in zone 6B. Um, so sometimes if you're looking for seeds or plants like that, that's a good thing to know. You want to think about how much sunlight, you know, the area where you want to put these plants goes, you know, gets during the day. If it gets you know, over six hours of sunlight in the summer, which means that the plant, if you planted it, would actually have a, you know, some form of um, shadow for six, over six hours a day. That's considered a sunny spot. If it's four to six hours a day where it can cast a shadow, that's considered partial shade. Um, and if it's underneath something and it doesn't put out its own shadow, that's considered um, shady. You know, but that's very important because if you put a shady thing, you put sneeze weed right into a shady spot, it's not going to thrive. OK, it might survive, but it's not going to be thriving. So kind of keep those things in mind. There's plenty of native plants for each of those categories. Same with soil and moisture. If there's a part of your yard that is always wet, um, you know, there are some plants that aren't going to like that. So you have to do a little homework that way. And then you want to think about mature size, too. You know, if this is a Joe Pye weed and it's 15 feet, where are you going to put that? You know, and is there going to be a place where it's out of the way and you can enjoy it and things like that? So you want to think about stuff like that as well. So now's the fun point to start choosing your seeds. Um, so let's talk about where you could get seeds. I buy a lot of my seeds from Prairie Moon, which is a native nursery um, that specializes in uh, native plants and seeds. And in fact, a lot of the stock pictures that I've used are from Prairie Moon. They don't pay me to say that. I wish they did because I certainly send them enough money. But um, Prairie Moon is a, is, a, is a place that's a native nursery that does this, as is Prairie Nursery. Um, you know, that's another place that does it as well. Seed libraries. The Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh, I believe in Lawrenceville, has a seed library. In essence, you can go in, you could take some seeds home. The hope is, is that you will return seeds um, to the seed library, you know, at the end of the growing season or as, you know, your plants come into uh, seed age. And some people do seed swaps on social media, you know, you could find some seeds that way. You can also gather seeds. I mean, that's a whole other discussion on how to do that properly. But you can, if you have a garden at your house, you can go and you can shake the seeds off of just about anything. 
clean them up a little bit, keep them, and then plant them again. Please don't go into other people's yards to do this. You know, don't walk through Shenley Park and start, you know, taking stuff. And really, there's a limit to how much you should because, you know, you're taking food from birds. You're taking, you know, the next generation of plants from this, you know, the, 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 the mother plant. So you don't want to take them all. You want to leave some for nature as well. When you're thinking about seeds, you want to get a single species. That's it, okay? You want to avoid a wildflower mix. First of all, like what is a wildflower mix? Are they all natives? That's what I would want. Is there other crap in there? I don't want that. So, you know, you want to make sure that it's a single species um, going from there. You want to buy a packet of seeds and not an ounce, okay? Some of these suppliers will sell you any number of different um, amounts of seeds. And really, you just need a packet. A packet could have 25 seeds if they're really large. It could have 100 seeds if they're somewhat small. You get a seed packet of something like anise hyssop. A packet has 1,000 seeds. An ounce of anise hyssop seeds is probably 12,000 seeds. You don't need that, okay? So just stick with the packet. And then you want to look for neonicotinoid free seeds. Okay, that's so neonicotinoids, neonics, if you want to sound like you know what you're doing, right? I always say that if you go into like a South, like a, like an East End nursery, and you ask like, oh, is this neonic free? Like you instantly get one of those coexist bumper stickers, and you can put it on your Prius and kind of go from there. But the insecticides, what happens with these seeds are, and then this is some places, you know, spray the seeds with an insecticide. So as it grows, there's already an insecticide inside the plant. There are some people who want the flowers, who want, you know, all the color and all the stuff we love about gardens without the bugs. I am not one of those people, you know, but they're out there. So it's important to do a little bit of research as far as staying away from the neonics for that reason, because we want the, you know, the caterpillar, at least I do, want the caterpillars to come to the gardens, have something to eat, and then, you know, be able to survive after their first meal. You want to take the seed, you know, you want to take the seed pack at home and read it, obviously. You want to check the species. I always cross-reference it with wildflower.org, you know, Again, you know, people use different names for different things. Mostly, you know, you don't have to go out and learn Latin um, or to learn all the genus and, and all this other jazz from there. But it does help in getting to the bottom of like, what is this thing? Because if someone names it something else, you know, you don't know, is this the native or is it something else? No codes for moist stratification. It may stuff say stuff like fall sowing. The one thing that's kind of interesting, like there isn't a standardized way to put this. So, you know, some will use these elaborate codes that mean it needs cold stratification for 30 days. It needs all this. And other people will be like, I don't know, put it in the ground and fall. You know, so you just have to kind of read that and, and think about it that way. If you get seeds that are called pre-stratified, which means that they are ready to go into the ground right now. Um, you know, I would stay away from those. Remember that, you know, the covering of the seeds, the enzymes that protect it, that's a survival mechanism. So they will survive in the packet for a while because they haven't been stratified. But if you've taken that away, you know, I would wonder just how much of those seeds are actually going to survive if you go to plant them. You want to note the pack dates. You know, you want to try to get the same year or the last year. If it's a couple of years ago, you're probably not bad. If it's like 2015, they might be too old and it might not be worth doing it. And then any seed packets that you get, you want to core and store in a cool, dry place. So, you know, I keep them in the refrigerator. You could keep them in your basement, but don't put them, you know, in your glove compartment. Don't put them in your shed that's outside, you know, things along those lines. Okay. I know, I don't know if there's anything in the questions or anything else like that. Any questions or anything else before we get moved? Is anybody still on the call? I will leave it open for questions. We have had some comments throughout um, just different shout outs and yeah, so people seem to be participating, but if there's any questions. Also, I appreciate the refrigerator uh, idea and 
I have found that I think I need another refrigerator for seed storage because it seems to take up more space than my partner would like in the main yeah. fridge. <laughs> same, same. I can, she can uh, talk to my wife about that one. That's for sure. All right, well, let's get moving. So we're going to talk about how, what you can build. And, you know, we're going to go back to that question of what would you like to plant? Um, you know, I'm going to offer a suggestion to use milk jugs um, for this because I find them to be readily available. So I'm giving you kind of one option if you don't know what to plant, and then also four options because you can fit four milk jugs in a milk crate, which makes it nice and easy and they're not blowing around. So what would you like to plant? So if you weren't, you know, if you just had one thing to choose. I always say that milkweeds are a good thing. Um, milkweed being the host for the uh, monarch butterfly. So again, caterpillars can only eat monarch leaves um, as they're growing up. Swamp milkweed um, is a great plant. It blooms from June to August. It gets about four feet tall. It's easy to, um, if you wanted to dig it up and move it around, it's a lot easier to dig up swamp milkweed than it is other milkweeds that have a really long taproot. If you look at the flower structure up top, it is easily accessible for any number of different um, pollinators. So, you know, butterflies, bees, you know, things along those lines. Um, so it's a good, uh, you know, it's a good thing to think about that if you can't plan anything else, or if you choose not to, and you're just thinking like, I would like one native thing, you know, a milkweed is a good one. However, if you'd like to do four, you know, keep a, consider these things. All four of these get to about three feet tall. And what, I'm, you know, I'm trying to do is have blooms from April to frost, you know, and the frost date around here is about October 15th. So the first one is Golden Alexander. It's the yellow flower up on the left. Uh, you know, it's from the carrot family. That's a nice landing pad for any types of pollinators from there, you know, and that blooms from April to June. As soon as that's dying out, Anna's hyssop goes all summer with these spiked flowers um, that again have a lot of um, you know, there's a lot of them. They continue to bloom and pollinators love them. And then right about July is when the great blue labellia goes into blooming. That's another good one. And again, there's this dearth that they call that's right around mid-July when a lot of plants are kind of done with their flowers and they start going to seed. Anna's hyssop and blue labellia are two that kind of continue going. Um, so then there's always something for pollinators, you know, as they're out looking for pollen or looking for nectar. And then finally, I put little blue stem as a native grass. You know, that doesn't really have any flowers per se, but it's wildlife habitat, it's nesting material for birds, and it's a host plant as well. And it looks kind of neat. It's, it looks nice in the, in the summertime because it's that light blue. Um, and then in the winter too, it turns an amber color. So it's something to look at um, also in the, uh, you know, uh, it's also in the winter time. So, you know, this is exactly what I'm growing this year as well. You know, and then I'm hoping that again, we can have blooms, you know, for almost the entire growing season and some cool stuff to look at, you know, both in season and out of season. So we talked a little bit about what will these host and what will these support. If you don't know any other butterflies, you probably know the one on the left, that's the monarch butterfly. And again, as we mentioned, that's a host plant for milkweeds um, and it's just gorgeous. Uh, the one in the middle here, that is a black swallowtail. This is my favorite, isn't it gorgeous? This host plant is the golden Alexander and it will also use carrots and parsley and things along those lines, you know, to lay its eggs. And, you know, that's what the caterpillars eat, but you know, I love it. so. I'll do anything to bring more to the yard. Um, on the right is an auto skipper moth. Uh, so moths also pollinate as well. Um, and you know, the host plant for this is the is the little blue stem grass. Then on the bottom are some native bees. You'll notice that honeybees are not on here. Honeybees are not native pollinators. They do a great job of making honey. They, you know, I wish I was a beekeeper. I wish I had hives, but I don't. So, you know, I'm beekeeping with this, you know what I mean? So, so, but they're not native. So when we talk about native pollinators, 
you know, we're talking about bumblebees, sweat bees, and things along those lines. On the left is a rusty patch bumblebee. This is a, uh, an endangered species and one that they feel is no longer in Pennsylvania. In the middle is a metallic sweat bee, very, very small, but still does pollination services. And on the right is a, um, is a uh, eastern carpenter bee. Okay, so originally I was thinking, oh, maybe I'll bring in stuff and like show you how to do it, but I'm not Martha Stewart and I'd probably cut my finger off. So I'm just gonna show you pictures of, of the process here. So here's some of the materials you might need. I'm using milk jugs. I'm using milk jugs because I've got two little girls at home. We go through about a gallon of milk a week. Um, so in a month's time, I have four of these. You can use the spring mix containers from Aldi. You can use water bottles. You can use red Solo cups. You know, whatever, whatever you want to use or whatever you have at hand, um, you can certainly use for this. But I'm going to show you how to do it with milk jugs. If you don't drink milk, I mean, I'm sure, I don't know, if you asked at Starbucks or something like that, maybe they have some. I've been known to raid people's I can't believe it says, but you know, you could raid uh, people's recycling bins, you know, on recycling night in your neighborhood, and you can do that. You need a box cutter or something that will be able to cut through the plastic. A soil mix, which we'll be getting into. Obviously, you're going to need some seeds. Um, and also a laundry marker. And a reason I'm saying, like, not just a Sharpie, you want a laundry marker, but you want to obviously write down on your jugs what it is that you're planning. And you want to make sure that you kind of get that done. Um, and a Sharpie has a tendency to fade in the sun. It can wash away with the rain, but a laundry marker can probably get you through the entire season. First thing you want to do is put drainage holes, no matter what you're using, okay? Tomorrow and into Friday, we're supposed to get almost three quarters of an inch of rain, all right? You don't want your seeds sitting in three quarters of an inch of rain. So they need a way to get all that water out. So on the bottom, I used a drill for this and just drilled a bunch of holes to make sure that that water has some place to go because your seeds can rot. Um, and that would be problematic, you know, then they won't sprout. Uh, you know, if you don't have a drill, you can use some sharp object to make little X's and the X's will allow for drainage, but also keep some of your soil back. You want to drill holes, you know, on the top too, to allow for ventilation and also for the rain to soak in. You know, we all heard of the, you know, the greenhouse effect and you've been in a car that even if it's cold out, but it's out in the sun, it gets warm. The same goes for this. You don't want to cook your seeds or cook your small plants. You want to have a little bit of ventilation there. You know, mark the cut line. I used a mug for this as kind of a jig. You want to start about an inch and a half from the handle. Um, because you want to make a hinge. Okay, so you go the whole way around, you leave a little gap right underneath the handle, and you get this. Ta-da! And that's going to allow you to get in there, fill it, and kind of, you know, check on things and go from there. I'm going to fill it with potting material. Now, you have a couple options here. Um, you can use a soilless mix or a germination mix that's usually used of things, you know, uh, some kind of like inorganic matter, vermiculite and perlite, which are aggregates. Um, because again, you don't want the seeds to be sitting in wet conditions. So you're looking for a material where, you know, the rain will not sit, that it'll continue to, to, you know, flow down through and just get it, I guess, in essence, wet enough. Vermiculite and perlite are things you can get at a nursery, um, and you can use that as well. In a pinch, you could use potting soil, you know, your standard, you know, thing like that. If you do that, I would cut it with sand just to make sure that the, you know, it, it drains better. Um, but I would not use dirt. Don't go out to your yard and just dig up dirt. And for a couple of reasons, number one, you know, you might be bringing in seeds like weed seeds. You want this to be rather sterilized. The only thing you want to be growing in here is your little seeds, you know, is the seeds that you know that you put in there, um, you know, so, so don't do that. Generally to germinate, you don't need the organic material. You don't need compost. You don't need things like that. It needs sun, you know, warmth and moisture in order to get that germination started. The first set of leaves that come out is all from inside the seed. After that point, 
is when the plant's going to start needing organic material to start creating other sets of leaves. You want to leave space at the top. If you're using a soilless mix or something that's really light, that's what I'm doing. I put a coffee filter at the bottom just so when I pick it up, not all the stuff drops out of the bottom. So you want to add the seeds next. First thing, reread the seed packet. Make sure you're doing this all correctly. You want to label the container both on the top and on the bottom because later we're going to snip off the hinge. So you want to know what the seeds are. One packet per container. Do not mix them. Okay. Because again, you want to look down and say, all these plants I know are anisus or whatever. You know, you want to know that right off the bat. As far as putting the seeds in, if they're large, like this wild blue indigo, you know, a little smaller, you could put them in little rows and kind of go from there. If they're small, like the anisysip, which is on the right, you just sprinkle them across and just do the best you can. Very important, read the seed packet. Oftentimes, native seeds, you do not have to bury. We learned on Sesame Street that, oh, anything that we're planting, we have to bury, you know, a quarter inch under the ground or anything else like that. In this process, we're going to allow the freeze thaw cycle and the rain and the snow to do what the seed wants to do, okay? So you just wanna lay them on top, tamp them down a little bit, but you don't have to bury them. Don't add anything over the top, okay? And put them outside. You need a place that receives sun and a place that's gonna get rain and snow. So you don't wanna put this stuff on a porch. You don't wanna put it on a balcony. It's gotta be somewhere where it's gonna hit the elements. So, you know, kind of the expectations for this. And if you want to do winter sowing, you probably want to get this done by February 1st. Okay. So if you're interested in doing this, you've got a little bit of time, but you, you know, you probably by the end of January, you want to get this stuff outside. January and March, you don't really have to do anything. Um, March to April, you want to start kind of looking at them sporadically just to see what's going on inside of the, uh, you know, inside there. April to May, depending on the different types of seed, you might start seeing germination. Once you start seeing plants popping up, you've got to start looking at the temperatures to make sure, you know, that they're not going to get cooked in there when it's 60 degrees, um, you know, April, 23rd or whatever, okay? Because if it's 60 degrees outside on a sunny day, inside that plastic little greenhouse, it could be 80 degrees or something along those lines. So certainly, if not before, you wanna remove the top of the jug, that little hinge, you cut that thing off, you know, once you start getting some growth. I was reading something and they said at the end of hoodie season. So if you can sit out outside without wearing a hooded sweatshirt, then that's your cue to remove the top of the jug as scientific as that is. May to June, you're looking for two to three sets of leaves. Once you get two to three sets of leaves, it's time to do one of two things. You either need to repot it and put it into a larger pot, or you can put it in the garden. I tend to repot because I don't want these little plants to get lost in my garden. Okay, they're going to need some care. They're going to need some other things. So what you would really, in essence, do is get in there, pull them apart very carefully. And, you know, you could put them in a larger pot. You could put them in a yogurt container with drainage holes. Um, you know, you could use an actual pot and you could put, four, you know, four or six of them in there because they're still growing and allow them, you know, to continue growing. But you do need something that's larger because, again, in that first year, perennials are going to continue to grow their grow their, um, their root systems. July to August, you need the water. All right. Now I said that these things are non-fussy, but they're not in the ground yet. And so, you know, the ground is able to hold moisture better. It holds temperature better, but when you're in a little pot, it heats up quicker, it dries out quicker. So you need the water every couple of days. If it's getting really crowded, or if you pick up the pot and you see that um, roots are growing through it, it's time to either put them in the garden or to, or to plant them back up into a larger pot from there. August, September is the best time to plant plants in the ground. Again, you know, Sesame Street told us you can only plant stuff in the spring, and it's not true. There are reasons why it's best to do, you know, August to September planting. The first one is, is it's not as hot. 
as it is in July. The second thing is, is that the ground has really, really warmed up and warm ground is what stimulates the root growth. And really, even if we have a, you know, a freeze that happens um, October 15th, like the ground stays warm until Thanksgiving, you know, so it will continue to grow. The roots will continue to grow under the ground up until Thanksgiving or when it goes to moment. There's a visual guide, April, May, depending. This is anise hyssop here too. Small, you know, little leaves coming up like that. When you get to May, June, you have a couple sets. It's time to move them onto a larger container. Um, you know, again, they don't have to be in separate containers. You don't have to have like a five gallon um, pot and only have one plant in it. You know, you could have a bunch in there, just allow them to grow. But this really for the first year on the right here is about as large as it's gonna get for the first year. Next steps again, water until established in the fall. After that, you probably don't have to do too much. Do not cut down the stems until spring. Leave all your perennials up all winter to help feed the birds, okay? You can cut them down. They say when the red bud trees are blooming. So if you see a red bud tree and you see those gorgeous little blooms all over its stems, you can go in and kind of chop down the old stuff and obviously enjoy them. That's, that's like the whole point of it. So, you know, what if nothing happens? We know that if you plant 100 seeds, you're probably not going to get 100 plants. Um, you know, there's research out there saying what you should expect, you know, uh, seed by seed. But I would really say that if nothing happens, keep the seeds. Because maybe they didn't get enough cold stratification last winter. And the other thing is, and I know this from swamp milkweed, and things like that, germination may continue throughout the summer. So if in May you have a few that have popped up, you repot them. You may come back in July and there's more because those seeds are finally getting the moisture that they needed, the sunlight that they needed, the warmth that they needed. You know, they just needed to be uncrowded a little bit more. All right. So you should, you know, if something, if it may, you peek in and nothing is happening, stick with it. Okay. And even if you don't have anything and you have the room, keep it till next year. Let it go through the process one more time and you might get something that way. Shout out to Prairie Moon uh, for the photo credits. The build instructions are for the Penn State extension. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. And I certainly want to know if anybody takes this on. I want, you know, you didn't let me know how it goes. I'm, I'm, I'm always curious about things like that. That was awesome. Um, thank you so much. I know that I learned so much um, in this short time. And so I hope that people will think about some questions that they might have. Um, in the meantime, there was one in the chat earlier, in addition to some awesome recommendations uh, that people put in the chat. But the person was curious about, and I know you, you mentioned um, that honeybees are not native, but native plants for honeybees. And I think um, so recommendations on those. And I was thinking that um, two things. One, it's probably the same plants, right, as for other native bees, except your planting style will probably change because my experience with beekeeping in Florida was that um, honeybees visit patches of flowers, not just individual flowers. So it's really about how you plant your plants and you want patches of things instead of just single flowers scattered around the garden to really bring in honeybees, which is why flowering trees and shrubs are also a really great option, but I don't know native recommendations of those in Pennsylvania, only Florida, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I know one thing, I mean, any natives are great because, you know, again, the best part about pollination and, and the, the flowers is that really any pollinator can use them, right? Um, honeybees in particular, I've learned, you know, they tend to stick on one trip, they tend to stick with one species of plant, whereas bumblebees, they'll be over on the lavender and then they'll come over on this and they'll come over on that and then they'll keep moving. You know, honeybees tend to go out and they want to stick with one species to take back to the back to the hive. And then the next trip, maybe they'll do another one. So, you know, with, I would say the native species are always great, but it's also important to plant in groups. You know, as Megan was kind of saying, you want three or more plants um, so it's not like, oh, there's just one there, you know, you want, you want a bunch that way. Um, uh, I think, you know, you want 
those plants that will bloom or a variety of plants that will bloom all season. So as the hives start coming up, you know, in the in the spring, you need some things that are plant that that are accessible to pollinators at that time, just as much as you need the things that um, are are blooming in October in that last rush as they're trying to fill their, you know, fill the boxes with honey for the winter. Yes. And my, um, I know my Monarda and Hyssop were both loaded with bees all year or this year. Um, so we have a couple questions. So first is what about planting seeds directly in the ground? This person is planning on using the cardboard lasagna method this winter in their yard. Yeah, I think you could certainly do that. Um, the, the one, there's nothing wrong with doing that, that's for sure. The one thing you need to keep in mind is that, you know, someone could come and eat the seeds, you know, a bird or a mouse or whatever like that, because they're not as covered as this process. Um, and then, you know, I know I still have trouble with this as things start to germinate, like what is it? Is it a seed? You know, is it what you want? Is it a weed? Everything looks the same, you know, so um, you just have to be, uh, ready for that too, about thinking like, hmm, like, is this the weed? Like, is this a weed? You know, what is a weed, right? But I mean, it's like, is this the plant that I want here or not? But you could certainly do that. And that's what, you know, a lot of the big nurseries do and things like that. And lasagna method is really good and a good way to get some, um, you know, organic matter into the, into wherever you want to put your garden. Um, so there is another question about starting, um, that person said, thank you. And then, um, starting seeds in seed starting trays kept outside. What about that? Yep. That's completely possible to, I would say whatever you have, you know, I try to keep, if we do go to a, um, a nursery, try to keep all those little buckets and, and pots and stuff like that. You could just as easily do that. Um, you know, if it's not covered, you know, you want to think about the, um, you want to think about, um, you know, if a bird or something else would come in and start digging around or a squirrel comes in and thinks this is the perfect place to put a, an acorn or things like that. You know, that would be one thing you just need to be prepared for from that. But it should work there as well. Um, you know, if you're talking about the seeds, if they're larger seeds, it's easy to get, you know, one in if you're having those really little things, you know, one in each pot. If you're doing um, smaller seeds, you know, you could surely still kind of sprinkle them over that way. So it seems like there's kind of a continuum of planting where like you just throw seeds outside, like, you know, all the way up to like a more tightly controlled environment, which will influence just, yeah, your control over whatever it is that you're trying to grow. Okay. So if you use solo cups, do you need to cover the cups? I would cover the cups. You could do a, if you have one of those plastic bins that are kind of opaque, you know what I mean? Like you can get those bins that you could kind of see through, you know, mm. you could line up a bunch of solo cups in there. You just want to make sure that there's drainage holes in both the solo cups and also your plastic tote top and bottom. So there's water not sitting in there. Um, and also so that there's some type of ventilation coming up at the top. But yeah, you could do that. I mean, you could certainly try that if you had a way to keep all the cups together so they don't blow away. So you'd almost need, you know, if there was something you could set them in so they don't blow all away, you know, that could probably work as well. So that was all the questions that were in the chat. Um, but I want to know if anybody on the Zoom would like to unmute and ask something. Since I've only heard Greg in my own voice today. <laughs> Put my email in the um, uh, in the chat too. I'd love to know if anybody tries this. Um, you know, please feel free to reach out. I mean, again, I'm not an expert in this, but I've, you know, it's, it's worked for me in the past, but I'd love to know if you have um, success or, you know, or even just what are you thinking about growing? I always like those ideas too. We all have these kind of go-to flowers and someone says, hey, I'm thinking about this. I mean, it's a, that's, a, you know, I want to know about those things too. 
And I'll also offer, I'm so excited to get back to the States and, and start thinking about this. I won't be back till next year, but I'm also thinking about native plants here. And um, I know it's a whole different uh, ball game here in Iceland. And, you know, these, this idea of native plants here, I, there's so much I need to learn about it because I know that um, just the soil here is so different that in order to build it up, they imported um, the lupine, which is, you know, so it's kind of taken over, but in a good way, it's building up the soil, even though it's non-native. So it's a whole other thing here that I have so much more to learn about versus in, in the States where it seems a little bit more clear cut. Yeah, there's always plenty to learn no matter where you are. You know, that's one of the fun things about this too. There's like, you know, again, it's that shock and awe too. But like we always have to learn. There's always a new plant that I would love to add. Um, you know, I think that's I think that's a good part of it. Yeah. Um, so one more question. Some people are saying that they can't wait to plant the ironweed. It's gorgeous and native annuals this year. Um, so this person has shade and partial shade areas. Are there any natives that come to mind they should look into? Uh, their daughter loves color. So I would say, I mean, you want to go to wildflower.org and you can do a search that way, you know, and say when, you know, if you put in shade, they'll just give you things that could survive in the shade. Columbine is a good one. Jacob's Ladder are two good spring um, perennials. Um, a lot of spring stuff, it's good because, you know, like the, the, the leaves aren't in yet, so they get the sun that they need from there. There are things like wood asters, and, you know, if it's wet, you could do may apples. And things along those lines are some of the native plants um, that come to mind from there. But just because it's shade doesn't mean that you can't have flowers as well. It may not be as as grandiose as some of the other, um, you know, as, as, you know, when you think about like the full sun part, but there are still, you know, opportunities to have, um, you know, flowers in, in the, um, in shady areas too. All right. And so one last question, um, this person, th there's more recommendations coming in the chat as well, which are great. So how do you grow a May apple? Yeah, I really couldn't tell you, to be honest with you, but I know that's a plant that grows in the shade. Um, you know, wildflower.org, go oh, look at that. But yeah, I have, I have not grown. I actually tend to, my gardens are all pretty much sunny. Um, so I haven't uh, dabbled in too much of the shady areas from there. But, uh, you know, I know a lot of people do have shady areas and obviously the more trees, the better. Um, but uh, if you do decide to go for it, I'd love to hear about it. All right. Well, thank you so much, Greg. This has been absolutely amazing. Um, and thank you all who are in attendance. I will be sending out the recording tomorrow to the email address that you registered with. So just um, be on the lookout for that. If you don't see it, check your spam. I'm also going to put in the chat. Um, these are upcoming events through Pitt Sustainability, um, if you're interested. And yeah, thanks for tuning in. Um, this person would like to know if you are offering more classes. Us or Greg specific, because Greg, you could start a whole business doing this. Yeah, well, maybe I will. Well, I'm happy to always talk about this stuff, but I feel like the Pollinator Habitat Committee would like to do more of this just to reach out because we want habitats beyond pit. We want them in wherever you happen to be living, even if it is Iceland. Agreed, agreed, awesome. All right, well, thank you.